Hello, fellow Rebel Capitals. Hope you're well. Back to some videos. We did the whole trip, the CBDC Road Trip to Freedom Challenge. And we are done. I'm still in Argentina. I had to come back to one of my favorite places, one of my new favorite places in the world. And that is La Mirada in wine country just outside of Mendoza. I'll show you guys what I'm dealing with here. There is... That's the view from my cabin. And those are the Andes. And it is spectacular. <laughs> Trust me, the video doesn't do it justice. I came back here just to have a couple days to get back in the swing of things and relax and enjoy myself. And I am doing that thoroughly. But let's get into this story. And uh, let's go right over to CNBC. And here's the survey we were referring to. Small business optimism hits 11-year low as inflation fears won't go away. Now, as we go through this article, it's all about inflation, input costs, wages, the wage price spiral they always refer to, which I think is mostly nonsense, and I'll show you why. But if you actually go to the survey, it tells a much different story. And I think this shows, this highlights how the mainstream media is biased towards painting this rosy picture about the economy overall, even though they're coming out with an article saying that optimism is at its all time low. I think they're kind of putting a spin on it to say, well, it's just about this stuff that is maybe transitory when in reality, it's more about what the yield curve is telling us. So. Let's go down and read the key talking points here. The NFIB, and again, we're going to get into the study, the specific study in a moment. Business optimism survey showed a reading of 88.5 down nearly a point from February to the lowest since December of 2012. That is really wild. December 2012. A quarter of all respondents cited inflation. And in, and in particular, high input and labor costs as their most pressing issue. So right off the bat, you get a feel or it makes you believe that well, the, the inflation, that's what this is really about. I forget. I mean, the economy is doing amazingly well. In fact, the economy is so good. That's why we have the consumer price inflation. It's, it's on fire. Let's keep going. A quarter of all respondents reported rising wages, biggest problem. We talked about that. A net 28% reported raising average selling prices for the month and 33% planned additional price hikes, according to seasonally adjusted data as part of those escalating costs. A net 38% said they'd raise uh, competition, compensation, excuse me, up three percentage points from February reading. That was the lowest since May of 2021. The consumer index more widely watched uh, figure of public will be released Wednesday and expected to show 3.4% headline rate, 3.7 core. Uh, the Fed's policy. Okay. 2%. We know that. However, the survey did show a big jump in expectations for rent increases by 8.7%. Now, here is where kind of the rubber meets the road, where these expectations, I think, are for higher inflation in rents. And remember, this is not really a measurement of rents. This is how the Fed measures it or the, uh, the BLS. And it's just basically a phone call saying, hey, what do you think you'd rent your place for? So it's not based on home prices. It's something called owner's equivalent rent. And it's not even really based, based on rents. <laughs> so it's really weird that we put so much emphasis on the CPI when if you look at the metrics that compose the, C, the CPI, you see that it, it it's really terrible for measuring what it's supposed to measure. And that's price increases or or decreases. 
But let's go to this survey briefly. Here we go. And I wanted to point out the summary here because this starts to show the spin from the mainstream media. Like they're making it seem as though this negativity or this pessimism from small business is all about inflation. And that's all about the economy just being too hot. <laughs> when there's a little bit different reality, there's an overwhelming 25%. Okay, well, what are the other 75% saying? So you've got 100%, 25% say they're pessimistic because of inflation, but that leaves 75% saying they are pessimistic for a completely different reason that CNBC isn't telling us. Here we go. The small business sector is showing signs of potential slowdown in economic activity with net sales expecting expectations falling eight points the main contributor let me go ahead and highlight this the main contributor to the decline in last month's index so cnbc just puts one little link to this and hoping that no one really clicks on it and reads the actual survey like I did. <laughs> because they're wanting you to believe that the main reason for the negativity is the inflation, which you could construe as the economy just being too good, where in reality, if you read the study, it says the main contributor is the, the small businesses believe that they're uh, we're going into an economic slowdown and they're coming to this conclusion because their net sales are actually falling. Not necessarily that their expenses are increasing or maybe it's a little bit of both. That their gross, the, the money coming in is decreasing and the money going out is increasing as well. Or excuse me, maybe I said that the wrong way. So the amount of money coming in is decreasing. The amount of money going out is increasing. And therefore, your margins are shrinking. And that's where you get this argument, or that's where I would push back against the wage price spiral argument. And I always go back to looking at loans and leases and looking at bank credit, and looking at M1 and M2, because I don't see how you can sustain consumer price inflation as a result of rising wages because you just eat at margins and sooner or later those businesses go bust. And if they go bust, the unemployment rate goes up. And then those employees that were making maybe more and more money are now making zero dollars, which would compensate for the amount of employees that were still employed that might see their wages increasing in nominal terms. So I wanted to go over to, I don't have a whiteboard with me, obviously, but just so you guys could get a visual of the numbers, we start, let's just assume, with an entire economy of $100,000, just to keep things super simple. And those, those dollars are spent. Uh, they go to businesses that are producing goods and services. And let's say those businesses, their uh, cost of goods sold are $50,000, and then their payroll is roughly 30,000, which gives them a $20,000 profit. And then that profit, they spend that and that goes back into the economy. And that goes back into this overall $100,000 number. So you've got the 80 in expenses, the 20 in profit, and that's what goes into this 100,000 total money supply. Well, let's adjust the amount that's going to the worker. Okay, well, we still have 100,000. We got 50,000 cost of goods sold. We got the 40,000 now. So then you'd only have 10,000 in profit. So your margins are shrinking. But then the economists, the, the, the pros, the PhDs at the Fed would say, well, yeah, 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 but they have more money, these employees, therefore they're going to spend it. And so the gross wouldn't be 100,000 anymore. Uh, now we would have 110,000. And then that goes to 58,000 cost goods sold. We got our 40, now 12,000. 
So it's not as big of a hit to the employer. But what this doesn't include, we go back, that's why I've got this line going all the way back here, because this assumed that the 20,000 that the employers were getting to begin with that were spent back into the economy was increasing and or staying the same, excuse me. And it's not. It would be decreasing to 10, and therefore the additional 10 would be a net wash with the amount of money that was being spent, assuming that every single dollar that was in the economy was being spent. This is a velocity of one, right? So in order for this to be true or to be possible, what would have to happen is you'd have to have an increase in the money supply. And that's why I've got the bank over here increase, let's say they're lending uh, $10,000 into the economy for mortgages that have to be paid back over the span of 30 years. Well, then those $10,000 are going to be spent. You increase the money supply. And now all of a sudden, you the, the numbers work, right? But if you don't have the increase in the money supply, and even here, the margins are being squeezed. But if you don't have that increase in the money supply, then the only thing that is going to happen it, by taking basically profit from the employers and giving it to the employees is you're just going to have this gradual uh, decline in the margins to the point, like we said earlier, where the businesses just simply go bust. And then the payroll goes from 40,000 per month down to 0,000. And so you have this gradual, uh, I guess you want to call it wage inflation uh, to the point where it creates deflation. Uh, very similar to the price of oil going up because you're just robbing Peter to pay Paul. So the price of uh, oil go up, 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 up. But the demand for energy is very inelastic. So you have to buy gas for your car, even if it's $8 a gallon. And therefore, if you're spending an extra $400 a month on gas, you have to take that $400 a month away from someone, uh, something else, some of their spending. And therefore, over the short term, higher oil prices can lead to higher overall prices because energy oil is an input to pretty much everything. But at a certain point, those higher prices create deflation because all those other businesses are going bust. And therefore, there's no money circulating to the employers, or a lot less money circulating to the employees. And then you have this downward spiral. And then there would be a lack of demand, which would bring commodity prices and energy prices down as well. Because even with inelastic demand at a certain point, the rubber is going to meet the road, where if people don't have a paycheck, well, then, they're, then they, they'd like to buy gas, but they don't have a choice. They're not going to be able to. So now... Let's see, there was one other... So going back to this CNBC article, I think the main takeaway is uh, the economy the, the, from small bit. I think you have a bifurcation in the economy. You have the small and mid-sized businesses are, very, are really struggling. And they can only keep up this game of uh, this balancing act for so long because they're sitting there trying to balance their top line going down and their bottom line increasing in businesses where the margins are already extremely thin. And if this continues, you are going to see the unemployment rate likely increase, assuming that labor force participation stays the same. While at the same time, all of these publicly traded companies that can borrow money from JP Morgan and buy all their own shares back, they're going to continue to get richer and richer and richer. So how, how does this play out when the mega corporations are growing and doing extremely well and we measure the overall health of the economy by the stock market going up, which it, it, it has been. And, uh, you know, at some point that's got to stop, but who knows when that will happen while the core of the economy, the small and mid-sized business, right now is just being completely hollowed out and decimated by the economic distortions that have been created by the government 
uh, especially that went into overdrive once we had the Cerveza sickness. So we'll have to wait and see how this plays out. Another thing that's interesting is the 10 year treasury has gone way up as far as the yield uh, is up over 4.4% yesterday down to 4.37. And we see commodity prices increasing dramatically. So this would lead one to believe that we are experiencing reflation. But if you, if you have that, uh, with the underlying cross current being the margins shrinking for these businesses, not only with payroll, but with their other input costs being commodities, you see how at a certain point it's unsustainable unless you have the banks stepping in and creating more money supply. And we'll get into that in a future video, probably today. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. As always, make sure that you're standing for freedom, liberty, free market capitalism. Got to check out Rebel Capitalist Live. I just spoke with Brent Johnson, and he is going to be there. We'll probably have him do a panel. He's not on the speaker list. I can show you uh, right here. This is rebelcapitalistlive.com where you can get your tickets. I actually just spoke with Mark Moss, too. He's speaking at an event in Santiago, and I might uh, go hang out with him uh, toward the end of this week. I've got to drop off my rental car back there anyway. But we've got some incredible speakers. Mike Green, uh, Kenny's going to be there, Snyder, Hartman, uh, Chris McIntosh. Actually, we're going to be doing a live stream with Chris later on today. Uh, Joseph's going to be there from the Fed. Ivor Cummins, if you saw that interview, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Wait till you see the presentation he is planning for Rebel Capitalist Live. It's going to be incredible. Got my good buddy Barnes there. We're going to hear some red pill stuff from uh, Rich Cooper himself. And uh, we got the VIP guests. Oh, Josh is going to be there. So obviously you got to get your tickets ASAP to meet Josh. <laughs> uh, we got the uneducated economist, Viva Fry. You can go ahead and put Brent Johnson on this list. This is an event that you're not going to want to miss. So get your tickets ASAP before the prices go up. You can do that at rebelcapitalistlive.com. And I will see you on the next video.